Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. We are in our shame trigger series, and we are tackling parenting with today's guest, Featherstone. They're a nurse practitioner currently in the Richmond, Virginia area practicing, as well as the owner of Eucalyptus Health, which is a telehealth provider that serves Idaho. Our conversation begins with the idea of flexibility being the key to parenting. And we all have an idea of what that child will be and the life we're going to have with them. And for parents of LGBTQ children, that is a disruption to a lot of times what they are thinking. And Featherstone does a great job of walking us through kind of the process that parents go through and honoring that process for them, but also honoring and giving that unconditional love and support to their child. And so I value their insight, and I hope that you do too. So sit back and join Featherstone and I as we flesh it out. Featherstone, thank you so much for being here and jumping into this parenting chat. Um, And so I would love to start off and have you introduce yourself so everyone can know who you are. Hardest question of the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Featherstone and I am a dual certified nurse practitioner, both in reproductive sexual health and psychiatric mental health. Um, I have a private practice that does telehealth to Idaho, and I also work in a larger counseling group here in Virginia um, called Pagano Wellness Clinic. And my specialty is working with parents and LGBTQ folks, um, specifically transgender mental health um, under that umbrella and people who have unusual relationship formations like ethically non-monogamous folks, Um, people that have historically been underserved or misunderstood by the medical community. um, And so they avoid care because they can't get understanding care. Um, And parents, I could go on forever about, but psychiatry is like, oh, you have a baby in your uterus you're under the purview of an OBGYN and an OBGYN is like, I'm not experienced with mental health medications. That's not my bag. And so there's this huge gap for, for people who are pregnant or breastfeeding to get like the care they need for their mental health. And it's so important because if parents are suffering, kids are going to suffer. Like that's, that's a major cause of trauma that, that trickles down, you know, generationally. So I feel like that's sort of my higher calling and what I love to do. Um, but I'm a big nerd and I love books and I love talking to people who are doing different things. Cause it's really interesting to get insight into a world that's different from mine. Yes. Well, thank you. That was beautifully said. And you like hit all the, my hot buttons, you know, generational trauma, helping <laughs> underserved, like wanting and, and a big part of, you know, fleshing out, it's like trying to bring the conversations that I usually get to have, because I just feel lucky that I've met great people bringing the conversations that I feel like we would have over coffee privately, but letting other people hear because with parenting, especially when you, when your kids are little, you kind of think I'm going to do it this way. And this is how they're going to be. If a, if I do a plus B, it will equal C and you quickly learn that is not the way it works. If only children were recipes. <laughs> if only. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, when our kids are young, for the most part, and of course, none of this is, you know, true all the time, but for the most part, it's like, you know, when they're younger, it's more like defiant and things like that, or, you know, like trying to get them to behave, I guess you could say. Yeah. But as kids grow up, you realize like, oh yeah, they're their own person with their own thoughts with their own beliefs. And no matter how much you think you're shaping them or, you know, whatnot, they, and, and isn't that what we want as parents too? Cause we want to raise our kids to be independent thinkers. And so with your specialty, you know, with having a passion for parents, children, and the whole, I love how you talked about the mental and physical, because it's so, as we learn more and more, it's so connected. Absolutely. And so I feel like, yes. And you have this like holistic approach of like, kind of respecting that the parents need the help, but also the kids. And so I would love to dive into that today on, you know, really supporting kids. And as you said, you know, with the LGBTQ community supporting that too, because I think parenting, that's such a struggle with kids and whatnot. And so I would love to get your insight because like I said, at the end of the day, I want to be, my goal is always 
to be, of course, the best parent I can be. I feel like that sounds cliche, but wanting my kids. We're all trying to do. Exactly. Like if you're not, there's probably a problem there, (laughs) but um, we're all doing the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. But But raising a moving target. Exactly. Exactly. And, and yeah, so I would just love to dive into that with you. I think it's easy when we start with one person's perspective. So Mm -hmm. I think we should start with the parent perspective because, you know, they were around first. They were aware of this child before the child was aware of the parent. So what we don't always talk about is um, sort of the vision that we have for our children before we even know anything about them before they're born. We have all these hopes and dreams that they're going to be a certain way and they're going to look like this parent or they're going to do this thing like this other parent. And that's not really challenged as much until those kids get to that developmental age where they're starting to sort of separate from parents. So think of that tween stage where they start to gravitate more towards peers and they're pursuing their own interests and they start to challenge the parents' values and the parents' outlook on the world and life. There's grief there Mm. for the parent. There's a cognitive dissonance. There is a difference between the expected reality and the actual reality. They thought they were going to have a kid that was looking like them and grows up and does like them. And they had, you know, even if they aren't fully aware of it, they have pretty specific vision for what they expected for their children. And, you know, it can happen anywhere along the way, you know, medical problems, stillbirth, unexpected Mm. death or Mm -hmm. illness, like that dream can be interrupted at any point. And life is fragile. And we don't always Mm -hmm. think about that. But in the case of LGBTQ teens, it has a lot of trickle down into their later life. So Mm -hmm. let's say you had a baby and his sex at birth was male and you expect him to be a boy and you think about him playing football. And when he's six, he's like, mommy, I really want an Elsa dress. I think you know, I think I want to grow my hair long. I think I want you to call me Sarah. And we have this big disruption to all of those things that the parent expected. Mm -hmm. Now it can be really different based on that parent's whole experience with gender or sexuality or how other people responded, you know, to people who were LGBTQ minorities in their lives. And so it's like, You know, they have all these different voices in the back of their head that they're now sorting through that weren't really potentially relevant to them before. But now, like, if you have a trans kid, that's a very different life ahead of both of you Mm -hmm. as a parent and as a kid. And so we have to acknowledge that grief. We can't just expect parents to be like, oh, okay, everything's fine. I'm on board. Yeah. Like at some point they're going to have to process this is different than they expected. And it's not that anything is wrong and that the grief isn't the child's fault. Mm. Like yeah. there's no fault here, but at the same time, if that kid is feeling that grief a lot, they can feel a lot of guilt. Yeah. They take they it on as resentful. themselves. Yeah. Like this isn't about you, mom. Yes. Like for an older teen yeah. to be like, I'm not doing this to hurt you. This isn't about you. Yeah. That's a thing that I had heard a lot was this isn't about you. And the thing is, it's not about the parent, but they're obviously very vested because that's, yeah. you know, their hopes and dreams embodied. It's funny when you said this isn't about you. I was thinking that's true for almost everyone on their healing journey, right? Because no matter, you know, your age or your identity, we all have stuff to unpack from our childhood and there's that it used, I think it's getting less now, but it used to be the joke. You know, you just blamed everything on your parents. And now we're on, now that there's more understanding, it's like, you're not blaming, you're just trying to understand and piece it together. And so. Cause um, we can't do better unless we understand where we came from. Yeah. And when you were talking about that grief, I was so glad you started out with that because it reminds me a friend of mine who's, um, you know, has a child with special needs. She shared the story of when, if you're packing to go to um, like Paris and you, you get all ready and you go to Paris and the plane touches down and they say, welcome to Holland. And it's like, what, what I, I have my 
you know, petty stuff. I'm ready to go. But you learn to, you know, you see eventually like Holland is great. You're so glad you're in Holland, but it just, that is not what you prepared for. So. It's still an adventure. Mm-hmm. It's still wonderful. There's still so much yeah. love. It's just different. Yeah. And there are things that we have, you know, culturally that we look forward to like, um, touchstone events, like yeah. buying a wedding dress or prom dress with your daughter. Well, if your daughter decides that she's not a girl, maybe you're going to be buying a tux with him. Mm-hmm. When it comes to identity and with kids, a, a lot of the chatter, you know, is like, they're too young, this and that. And so some parents, every parent approaches it differently and it's regardless of age, but like they, there's going to be people that have different opinions across the board of what they think about this. And, and I respect that where I'm coming from a lot of the time is like, well, you might, you meaning me and everyone, you know, we all might have our own opinions, but at the end of the day, especially if it's your kid, isn't the end goal to have a relationship with your kid, regardless of what your current opinions are. That so does that I'm make hearing, sense? Yeah. What I'm hearing is, are, are we talking about like the trend of people to push their children away when they're not what they expect? I mean, or are we talking about respecting autonomy of young people to make this decision? Because that's really what I feel like a lot of it boils down to is that parents aren't yet used to respecting the autonomy of these, of these children, because legally they aren't autonomous, but if self-definition, you know, that's not legality. Mm -hmm. That's, that's that person deciding who they are. And, um, that's not anybody's to decide, but them, no matter what their age is. I appreciate that. Um, I was, I had a conversation with a woman and she's a trans advocate, you know, for, for policies. And, um, she hosted a talk where we could kind of, you know, just ask questions and it was, it was wonderful. And, um, one thing she shared that I just thought was really powerful was for her journey. And she talked about others, like just being as a parent, okay. That if your kid says they identify as one thing and it changes, to support them where they're at. That was the point of it was to support them where they're at and not get so tied in and fearful that if they currently identify one way that supporting them will pigeonhole them into that forever. Is that absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a way as a parent to be supportive of we're going to love you no matter what you look like, no matter what you dress like, no matter who you love. Yeah. Period. That is the blanket universal acceptance. That is wonderful. Now, when I, when you first started talking about that, the, the concept of like fluidity, Mm -hmm. um, being guaranteed. And that was where I was like a little hesitant because I was like, so many people will try to reassure parents. This is just a phase you just wait and they're going to come out the other side of this and it's all going to go back to the way it was. And I hate that. Because oh, it's like the yeah. parents are just grinning and baring their teeth and, and, and like white yeah. knuckling it. And there's not like genuine acceptance and like curiosity. Yeah. And I, and I'm glad you mentioned the phase because I wanted to touch on that too, but yeah, it wasn't a phase as in like, you're on this side of the line and then you go to this side of the line. It was an evolution. It was just a continuing. And that's where I thought we all should be evolving, right? Like we're all constantly growing. And I think there's fear of being attached to one idea. Yeah. And I think for parents, it's important to stay curious and, and to ask mm-hmm. questions about like, well, what does this mean to you? And how can I support you best? What pronouns would you like me to use in front of people that know? Do you mm-hmm. want me to use different pronouns in front of people who don't? Because mm-hmm. respecting that young person's ability to selectively disclose, to come out to people where it feels comfortable and to not where they don't feel comfortable, that is ultimately giving them the most control and autonomy about not only who they are, but how safe they feel in different spaces. I just want you to almost say that just that last part again, because I think it's really important. So it's giving them the control and the autonomy to feel safe. Giving them the control and autonomy to disclose their identity based on where they feel safe. Yeah. Because from my personal experience, um, 
I spent a lot of my early life just identified as bisexual. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I know that I like women and men and that's just the way it is. And, um, you know, I enrolled in the military when I was young, I was 20 years old and I really loved being in the army, but I don't think I had the insight at the time to really put my finger on what it was about Mm -hmm. it. That felt so, um, good in terms of my gender. Yeah. Um, I think I really liked that everybody was green. There was no men and women there. Just everybody was green. Everybody was the same. And so there was this sort of um, expectation of androgyny mm. that I think made me really comfortable in a way I hadn't ever been before. Um, because I'd always kind of felt like I was bad at being a girl. Like I didn't really mm. know makeup and like I tried to be feminine, but it felt like like it was really put on. And so it never really mm-hmm. felt comfortable, but in the army, I wore boots and pants and the same thing as everyone else around me. And I was expected to be tough and, you know, assertive and not things that are traditionally expected from women. Um, but it wasn't until almost 10 full years later where I was having a conversation with somebody and, I think they use the metaphor of a queen. They were like, you're the queen of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh God, that makes me kind of want to vomit. I was like, I don't Mm -hmm. identify with that at all. And this was in the era of like Game of Thrones was really popular. And I was like, let me tell you, I'm not Cersei. I'm not the queen of anything. I'm Brienne of Tarth. I'm the female knight who's very androgynous if you're not Mm -hmm. a Game of Thrones person. And so- we had this conversation and the person I was talking to is like, do you think that might be sort of some fluidity in your gender? And I was like, I had never really thought about it. And so then I started this period of reflection. I was like, oh my God, that's absolutely it. And so I had Mm. um, a really close friend who is trans and just brilliant. And I respect her so much. And I went to her and I was like, do you think I might be like gender fluid or non-binary? Like, what do you think? And she's like, oh, I've known for so long. (laughs) And it was so validating. It was so validating, but it was also really surprising because I was just coming to this realization. And she was like, the first time we went shopping, you made a beeline for the men's flannel. Like, I'm not surprised at all. Yeah. So sometimes, um, external affirmation like that for people as they're on that journey, you know, if a parent could say, "Eh, yeah, I I can maybe see that. I think that is going to build a lot of rapport and affirmation Mm. for a teenager who is really digging into this um, and sort of maybe verbally processing it with trusted people. Yeah. Um, Because I think it's something that we talk about a lot more than we ever did when I was a kid. Like when I was a kid, no one talked about gender like this. Oh yeah. And that's, I think, something that I have seen, you know, my perspective so far is like, isn't this a good thing that there's more ways for kids to figure out their identity, right? Because there's, there's so much, but the flips or the opposite end of the pendulum is I feel like that fear of there's too much kids are too confused. There's too much. So I would love for you to speak on that because Um. I kind of want to laugh when, when you said yeah. kids are too confused. Um, I don't think kids are more confused today. I think they just have better ways to describe how things are confusing. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know it was confused. Life is confusing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. But I think that like, we have a lot more awareness of how prominent gender roles are and how um, masculinity and femininity do not just have one stereotype. Mm -hmm. And so people have more options, I think, for describing the nuance of their gender, which is how society expects them to be based on their biology, based on previously, based on Mm -hmm. sex. Um, But gender is just this construct of like, okay, what is your gender? Okay, this is what we think you might act like or speak mm-hmm. like, or look like in relation to other people. So yeah. I don't think kids are more confused today. I think yeah. kids have a better vocabulary and more concepts and it's constantly evolving. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the past four years, I have discovered so many new terms and ideas about gender. Um, 
One of my favorite tools that I use with other clinicians is something called the gender bread person. Um, and it's this really cute PDF infographic of a gingerbread man. And they talk about the difference between sex, which is, you know, biological chromosomes, gender, which is the role you play in society and how you view yourself. And then gender expression, which is like how you dress. And if you wear makeup and nail polish or mm. um, certain kinds of jewelry that historically have been associated with men or women, and then talks about sexuality in terms of like, who are you romantically attracted to? Who are you sexually attracted to? Those may not be the same. Mm. And so when kids talk about these terms, like a like a romantic, like I don't feel romantic attraction to people or ace, like asexual, I don't feel sexual attraction. They can still have the other. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, so there's still like relationships with other people. Um, but you know, that's a really different idea back. Let's think about just 50 years ago in the 1970s mm -hmm. talking about having a relationship that is either devoid of sex, but still romantic. Like that was not something commonly talked about. Mm -hmm. There was free love. There was mm -hmm. sexuality and, you know, a lot of progressive things because of the birth control pill and an evolution in how people related in terms of sexual activity, not necessarily leading to having a child. So there was a lot By the way, you're talking about the seventies because in my head, like I think probably other listeners are doing, we're thinking, oh, she's talking about the fifties, but no, it's the seventies because it's 2021. Yeah. But isn't me, that crazy? <laughs> like, I know I almost started talking about the fifties and I was like, that's not 50 years ago. Uh huh. Cause you don't have free 50s. love. I was like, wait, free love. Oh, we're not talking about like, leave it to beaver. We're talking about no. Oh, okay. No gender roles, you know, from the fifties yeah. to the seventies yeah. had already shifted a lot. Yeah. I'm grateful for your insight. Thank you. And, um, I was thinking my thought process is kids, especially like you said, in the tweens, Tweens start pushing the boundaries usually. And so then you look at teenagers in high school and, you know, you look, it's, it's not as common now, but back in like the eighties and nineties, all of the teen movies are like, those are those kids over there. Those are those kids over there. Kids have been giving themselves labels when other kids have been giving other people labels forever. Well, let's look at it through an anthropological lens. It's culture. Mm -hmm. They're picking the culture that they feel aligned with. Mm. You know, if, if you are queer, if you are bisexual, if you are trans, you automatically belong to this group and it's a group with its own outlook and lingo and, um, history. It's a culture. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, talking about you know, from our era more like there were skaters and there were goths and there were the, you know, the country kids and, and, you know, the people who were in like R&B and hip hop, that was very distinct sort of cultural lines. But I found that like, in my experience, a lot of the people who were like wearing the black eyeliner and being reclusive, like these were the signals that they felt different mm -hmm. and they gravitated towards these things. And those were actually some of the most accepting and mm -hmm. warm and welcoming kids because they knew what it was like to be on the fringe mm -hmm. and very, very high proportion of those kids when I was growing up was LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. So, um, like the theater kids that I hung out with in high school, like more than half were, were queer in some way or fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would probably say that like, if we looked at their trauma, like their generational trauma, mm -hmm. probably pretty high. Like mm -hmm. mental health issues in parents, substance use in parents, um, domestic mm -hmm. violence in the home, you know, sad stories, but it's mm -hmm. really, really common. Um, and it's just like, how do people take that and then incorporate it into who they are and how they interact with others? Yeah. Man, I have so many thoughts Sorry, in my that head. Got heavy. <laughs> that got heavy. Real oh, fast. I love it. Well, no, I mean, it's like, I have so many questions and, and it's hard too, because wanting like, Oh wait, okay, let's get back to parenting. But I'm like, Oh, now I have questions about this. And what are your opinions on this? And so let's, so like I said, I, I have all these voices in my head, you know, cause it's like, I hear the opinions on all the different sides. And, and for me, it just always comes back to wanting to connect with your kid, 
regardless of any of the other things. And that's why when you were describing the trauma, I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, I can hear it now. Oh, it's trauma. And, and well, in the moment when your kid discloses to you something about their identity, that moment will forever be ingrained. You can mm. never undo whatever you do or say in that moment. It's like a first impression. Yep. Their coming out story is something they'll never forget. And mm. coming out isn't something that you do once and you're done with. Coming out when you're queer is something that you do in whichever areas of your life that you want to, but it's never just once. It's like mm. when you meet somebody, you can either withhold that part of yourself and wait until you feel safe and come out later. Mm -hmm. Or you, a lot of us don't have that privilege though, to just start a relationship and be like, Hey, my name is Featherstone and I'm trans mm -hmm. and my pronouns are they, them because it's not common yet outside of, you know, really young people to necessarily share pronouns as a part of a normal introduction. And so if you are outside that strict gender binary that aligned with your sex at birth, you, the only person saying pronouns is the person who's trans and way to put the spotlight on yourself. Like no one wants that kind of attention generally, unless they like being a disruptor mm -hmm. or they know they're in a position where no one's going to engage in microaggressions because it would be frowned upon in that setting. But I'd say that's probably pretty rare. Cultivating a environment of safety for trans kids means doing little things like that. Like asking about pronouns when you meet somebody, because when you're just showing that you're aware that that exists, kids are going to be like, Oh my God, they have mm. the coolest parents ever. They're safe to talk to. Mm -hmm. And once parents make kids feel safe, kids can tell them about all kinds of stuff like drug use mm. and sex and things that are potentially dangerous. Like if parents, if I could give parents any advice today, it's it. work on your poker face. Be cool. That's the be cool. Be cool, be, man. Be cool. Be cool. That's, that's, I want to get that on a shirt. I, <laughs> because I told that to myself too. Because your kids can be, be like, cool. mom, I was at this party and there were people snorting cocaine and I think they were having an orgy in the back room. Oh my like, gosh. I got to work on my poker face. <laughs> <laughs> See? Because you got to, you got to be like, man, wow. how did you handle that? How'd you feel? What'd you do? So I just had another parenting conversation for this series, you know, for the parenting mm -hmm. series. And we talked about, you know, asking questions to our kids. And I can't remember if this was on a podcast or I just talked about it because I talk all the time. But I said, I feel like I often need to, you know, because I'm trying to raise my kids to be kind, loving people and, you know, just fill this role that I am as their parent. They're all worthy. They're all knowing being, which you're not. And that's, that's all not true. She's making a face guys. And that's, and I'm saying, you know, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the whole point is like, that's kind of, I feel like how a lot of people go into parenting. And then you realize like, wait, we are in this together. They're their own person. You know, it's this whole journey. And, um, and there's no parenting class before you actually have kids. Like no. there's a difference between reading the manual on swimming and being thrown in the ocean. And that's yes. what it's like when you have a baby, like you yes. can take all the, the diapering and infant CPR classes yes. in the world and breastfeeding classes. And you don't know what's behind that door. No, that's why it's so hard. <laughs> yes. And, and I've learned, you know, my kids being nine and 11 now, you know, if we're watching a show and they do something in the show that I feel like oh, I should comment on that. And, but it's like, they're tuning me out. Like it's, I, we're getting, it's like, I'm, they're not little kids anymore that I constantly need to be saying, no, don't touch that hot stove. No, you know, the hot don't do that. Like, and so when you said the part about, you know, the poker face and be cool, like when they talk, it's, there's that part of me that's like, but I need to tell them like, but you're not doing that. Are you, you didn't do that. Right. Like, we, we know that that's not good to do. But like, <laughs> I see your but, look of distress, but yeah, here's the thing. Here's that's why I talk thing. to people. Cause I want to work all that shit out. Cause yeah. And not with your kids. It's, that's it. Why do you, that's why I started this podcast. Cause I gotta work yeah. all this shit out. But that's the thing you, every parent needs yeah. other parents to talk to. Like no one should mm. be parenting in a vacuum. Yes. 
And ideally we have other parents. So, so one of the things that I wrote when I was prepping for this was, I was like, ask me about allo parents. Have you ever heard this term? Oh, <laughs> tell so me. So an allo parent is like, think about the, the village of societies way before. There'd be lots of aunties and uncles and other adults, your parents' age, who were around and available, yes. who would also act in that parental role if necessary when your parents weren't around. But when we all live in our little houses with our 2.5 children and a mm-hmm. female parent and a male parent and a Labrador retriever, you don't have that kind of support. And that support is not just for kids. That support is for parents. For sure. Yeah. Because that's emotional support for parents. Mm. That's potentially safe other adults for kids to confide in. Because kids can tell when their parents get wigged out about stuff, when that poker face isn't quite good enough. And they're like, shit, my mom's going to be really mad. I drank beer at that party. But like this weird thing happened. And I kind of want to talk about it with an adult who isn't going to feel like they need to punish me. So I'm going to go talk to my mom's friend, Sarah. Yes. Okay. Um, You know, I feel like we've kind of talked with the other series. We've talked about allowing yourself to look at the areas you've, you've made mistakes in and screwed up in and have the regrets in that that's a good thing. And we've talked about how to connect with young kids. And I feel like it's these teenagers, because I think when your kids are young, you're so in it. So you're like looking at the blogs and it's new. So you're just like, I got to figure this out. But by the time they're teenagers, you're exhausted. And that's when our kids, I feel like that's when they're becoming totally their own people. And it's so easy to just lock it down. So absolutely. You made a comment earlier about like, I'm going to be a parent. So I'm going to be this omniscient, like omnipotent. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it gets easier sort of taking that down with a tween or a teenager because they know you don't know everything. They are acutely aware that you are not perfect. And I think it, it brings so much authenticity to look your teenager in the eye and say, look, this is what I was thinking. And this is what I was feeling. And this is why I made this decision. But I recognize now that maybe I would have done it differently. And I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry that it didn't feel fair. How do you think we should go moving forward? Because I think we should do X, Y, Z. What do you think? Because that really levels with them and it demonstrates how you want them to treat people in their lives. You want them to be able to put away the shame and apologize when they make mistakes. I'm clapping. I'm clapping. Because if we can't apologize to our children, how are they ever going to apologize to their partners? Mm-hmm. They're just going to hold on to defensiveness. Mm-hmm. And we can't model defensiveness to the people that we love most. Mm because we love our children more than anybody else. Like, let's be real. We love our partners. We love our parents. We love everybody. But like, it is so different when it's your child. Yeah. And so leveling with them that like, no, I'm not an expert. No, I read all the blogs, but that doesn't actually prepare me. Like there is no one right way to do this. And yes, I treat you differently from your sibling because you are different humans with different needs. Okay. So here's a question. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to level with them. I want to model this behavior. I want to show them respect, but Featherstone, but, you know, kids and teens, they're, they have so much. They're just a kid. I'm the parent at the end of the day. I say, how do we balance those? How do we balance those seemingly opposed ideas? Oh, I love that. Seemingly opposed because I, it's not either or it's both. And yes. So can we hear their feedback and can we integrate it in some way, but also say, no, these are the hard boundaries because of safety. And because these are the rules of this house, because this ultimately is my house and legally Mm -hmm. it is my right to enforce them. And I am willing to compromise in these areas, but these things I will not. And so a lot of it is just learning to, to communicate really succinctly and clearly with them. And sometimes, you know, the, the part of the brain that's not fully developed in teens is at the very, very front. It's the prefrontal cortex. And it's what's in charge of like higher logic and reasoning and judgment. That's why teens drive really recklessly and get more tickets and more accidents than older folks, because they don't have as good of an ability literally with their brain to juggle all the things they're trying to juggle and evaluate risk. 
And so I've actually had a couple of very interesting conversations with my own boys about this, about like, you know, I think these kinds of decisions about like what you do in terms of riding four wheelers or driving cars, I think I really need to keep those decisions until I'm really sure that you're ready for them because they could have really serious consequences. And I, and I fleshed out why, and I told them about how their brains develop. And, you know, it's not really done until you're like in your early twenties, but it really is like explaining yourself. And that's really humbling for a lot of parents because a lot of them are like, so caught up in that hierarchy. This is my role. I have the authority, but that's so dehumanizing to the child who is now like moving into an age where they have more understanding and they have more autonomy and the parent really is losing like a certain degree of control because that child isn't even in the home usually the majority of the day. So like acknowledging where you do and don't have control, but communicating like explicit expectations and what the consequences will be and not necessarily to be punitive. There are some kids that respond to that, Mm -hmm. but, but reasonable consequences that mimic what happens out in the world so Mm. that like, you can't go joy riding and not have consequences. Like you're going to go to prison. You're going to not have a car for a while if you go joy riding. Mm. And so just thinking about what are natural consequences, like what would happen out in the real world and what do you want to have the most impact because it aligns with your values and talking about values when you discuss consequences with your kids. Mm-hmm. So that they'll think about those sort of things. Like, is this going to be a thing that like is a nuisance or is this something that like affronts my parents' values because it's important to them? Mm. What do you mean by that? Can you explain that a little more? So like punctuality Mm. has different levels of importance to different people. Mm -hmm. Um, What does respect look like in your family? Mm. Is it disrespectful to show up late or is it disrespectful to ignore somebody and give them the cold shoulder? So Like for me in particular, cold shoulder is my absolutely not super disrespectful. I'm from the military. You respond when you're spoken to. And that's just like my, my, my thing, my pet peeve. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of other military folks would be like, you better not be late. You better be early. Mm -hmm. That's disrespectful. So if I give you a nine o'clock curfew and you're not home, there's going to be held a bit. There's going to be a consequence. You're going to lose some sort of, you know, privilege for me. It's like, I don't mind if you're 10 minutes late. I'm not going to be a stickler about that. That doesn't communicate disrespect to me, but please let me know that you're safe and that like something's not wrong. Mm -hmm. And so like each parent, even within one family might have very different values. And so having a clear idea of, well, do I have to speed home so I'm not in trouble or do I need to shoot a text? You know, those are different, yeah, different things. And if a teen feels like they're chasing a moving target, if it's not clear what the expectation is, they're going to get really frustrated. If say that one more time, if a teen, if the moving target, that's so If good. a teen feels like they're chasing a moving target, as far as expectations with parents, that's going to be super frustrating. Mm. Mm-hmm. Just like we would be with a boss or someone else, if the expectations we thought were clear were changed without notice. Yes. <sighs> Featherstone, I think you're going to have to come back because there's like so much if you're willing, <laughs> because there's so much, because I think we have just scratched the surface of it. Um, but if there's anything we haven't talked about or kind of a general takeaway, what would you say from today's conversation? I think one of the really hard things for parents of trans teens in particular is what they let them do in regards to medical treatment and or surgeries, because I think a lot of parents um, are worried that it is a phase. And if it's a phase and we try puberty blockers or we try hormone therapy, what does that mean? And so I think parents have to recognize that the more they push back, the more the kid is going to want it. And the Mm. more they're going to feel alienated because they're not feeling respected. And so it usually doesn't hurt to go and have a conversation with a pediatric endocrinologist or, or a provider who offers gender affirming healthcare, 
Because what we do know from the research is that gender affirming healthcare saves lives. It saves lives for trans teens, forcing people to grow up in a body that does not match who they are is traumatic. Mm. And so I, I knew that I wanted to talk about the Trevor project when I came today because mm. they have an amazing program. Um, they do like a crisis line either by text or by phone um, for young LGBTQ people. It's an amazing organization. Um, I have friends who volunteer with them and just a great resource all around um, for teens who are maybe feeling alone or like they're having a hard time because they're isolated because of COVID and maybe their family of origin is not supportive. But for parents to just understand that any good healthcare provider is going to have a really clear conversation with you about risks, benefits, and alternatives. And so talking with that provider and with your team about like, okay, these medications are an option. These surgeries are an option. And, and having a clear conversation with your kid afterwards about like, okay, if you feel like this in X number of months or by this time, you know, next year and having clear agreements about like, if you still feel like this and this is truly who you are, I want to support you, but but like really disentangling it and making sure that both the parent and the team like have clear communication and expectations about when next steps will be going to happen. Because for a teen who feels stuck in this body that doesn't fit, knowing that in three months, in six months, they're going to be able to go back to that doctor and start taking hormones to look more like who they, who they are on the inside, like that instills so much hope and they're going to feel so much more connected to their parent for trusting them to know who they are. And if they do change their mind, great. The parents still invested in the relationship by saying, I trust you to know who you are and I will respect your decision. Because ultimately, if we lose our kids to suicide mm -hmm. because we didn't listen to them, mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not you having a relationship with your kid. You're gonna lose your kid. Mm -hmm. And it really is life-saving care. Gender affirming hormones, gender affirming surgeries are life saving. Like there is no doubt, the literature is very clear on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want parents to hear that that like, it is not benign to deny who your kid is. It is not benign mm -hmm. in any way. I appreciate you sharing that, and that's been something that is just heavy on my heart. You know, with just losing people to suicide, you know, and you think, and the teens struggling and, and what's something you said in there, what I thought was really powerful too, is that kind of identifying the ways you can support your child and their identity and their journey through that, but still also having your own boundaries, you know, but communicating that and communicating the support and whatnot. And, and I think too, giving a, the child hope for the future, you know, um, mm -hmm. because you, we talked about, um, there's certain times where we share and, you know, whether it's a coming out with a sexuality or identity, I mean, there's just so many things that when our kids tell us something like, and who know, you know, it's ingrained in them and figuring out ways that yes, we can be supportive and loving, still have the boundaries. Absolutely. You're always going to be their parent. And so it's always going to be your job to give them boundaries about, you know, kid things. Yeah, But this really recognizing that their concept of who they are is really not in your purview. Yeah. That is their wheelhouse, not yours. Yeah. Um, despite all the dreams that you've had for so many years. As we wrap up, I would love, you mentioned the Trevor project and mm -hmm. you know, there's so, there's so much resources out there, but there's also a lot of noise out there. Mm -hmm. And so once again, it's kind of my, my view is regardless of your opinions of your personal opinions, as you beautifully said, your, your child is not your child's identity is not your purview. Did you say? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yes, regardless of that. So what are ways parents can educate themselves? So without it being worked out between them and their kid? and their kid being the one to educate them, what are some ways they can 
uh, besides listening to you and this podcast, but um, what are some other ways? I feel like there's a lot of great media out there um, and peer support for parents. So back when I was a kid, back in my day, um, PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, was sort of like the the commonly known nomenclature, like, oh, she's got a PFLAG mom, was like code for like, her mom is super supportive and like on board and educated. But I don't know that that's necessarily as current anymore. Um, I think there's still an active organization, but a lot of times it's more local. Um, I know in Idaho, they have the Mama Dragons, who are like the supportive parents of, of trans and queer teens, um, because they talk about being like very protective and like <laughs> sort of aggressive towards people who are a threat, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know you're in Northern Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, Well, we're not too far away here in Richmond, um, but we have side by side, which used to be Rosemi. um, And they have a lot of like support groups for queer and trans teens and young adults. um, And and they would know where to send parents. So really looking for your local LGBTQ hub um, is really important for like connecting and having social support, both for young people and their parents. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of the, the movies I feel like really opened a lot of eyes um, that's sort of like a cult classic. It's called But I'm a Cheerleader. Mm. And it's about a group of teens who go to like a um, a camp to fix them of their homosexuality. And it displays a lot of interesting family dynamics between these teens and their parents. Um, and so I feel like that's a great place to start. Um, there's also a more recent movie because that's sort of an older one that's called Trans and Trump Land that I've heard is very, very eye opening um, and much more recent. I think 2020 or 2021 um, that came out. So there's lots of media out there that talks about the transgender experience, interactions with family of origin, um, and that can be really eye opening for parents to recognize like the harm and the difficulty of of the lack of acceptance mm-hmm. Um, for them to really examine how they respond. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me. Like I said, I know we just, there's just like the tip of the iceberg. So thanks for, <laughs> and, and letting us go in a, a million different directions. Cause there's so many things we could talk about. So always, I love opening up all the cans of worms. So good. Thanks for listening to flushing it out with Samantha Spittle where we explore growth and healing through vulnerable conversation. Our hope is that you feel seen and find tools for growing resiliency and tackling your own growth and healing. Be sure to subscribe and check out the VIPs and other resources at samanthaspittle.com. This has been a Spitfire production. Thing I've ever heard.